Okay, well, welcome back for our CoreCast with us, Linda McNutt Foster with Cortex Leadership Consulting and Judith Glazier. Judith, what if you want to have a good relationship with someone at work and they don't want to have one with you? Or almost worse, it seems like, what do you do if you want to build trust with somebody but they don't trust you? I don't know how, because to me, I've always been told and I've always lived that trust is a two-way street. So if you want someone to trust you and you want to trust them, it has to happen both ways, I would assume. Becky, you brought up a really important word that is so embedded at the heart of conversational intelligence that I'm glad we're having a chance to explore it. So I want to say um, that the, at the heart of trust, something happens that makes, first of all, trust so important and also makes us understand why it's so difficult when we lose trust with someone, why we get so stuck. So let me just give you a little bit of background. The first time I meet you, which was in person, right, today, um, I put in my brain a little dot that has the name Linda on it and it has you on it. It's all imprinting you. Our brains were designed this way. Animals did it, still do it. That's part of how they know who to sniff out, who's good and who's bad, and remember whether they've been hurt by a person or not. It's an incredible thing, but we have this memory system in the hippocampus. It's, uh, think of the word hippo. It's big, right? And so I've now imprinted you, and every time I have an interaction, that goes and gets collected around that little spot. So the next time I'm going to see you, if I've had a breach of trust in the last encounter, that becomes the biggest thing that sits on top of my knowledge of who you are, my instincts about who you are, and I will never be able to remove that imprint. I, if I do the right things, I can push it down below the others, but because trust between human beings is the primary thing that we need to connect with another human being, that drives our interaction. And so a negative experience like that is imprinted. It's the smell that I have of you before I see you. It's how I prepare to meet with you again is fear that something else is going to happen, right? And so that's why at least understanding trust and distrust is so important in any place where people work together. So far, does that make sense? I oh, yeah. Yes, I was thinking about if you have such a strong imprint, you really do have to create a lot of experiences to go over top of that. So you're, because it's instinctual, right? So, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, I needed to remember that this was dangerous. I, if I forgot that, I could die. Yeah. I could get eaten. So the brain is this instrument, this organ that's trying to keep us safe, right? right? And so how difficult it is for us to go, okay, I'm feeling that little feeling, but all these new experiences that have happened would make me think that I should trust this person and I can trust them now. So this is, again, the importance of how we use words to anchor and then how what's going on in the brain, we have to connect the two of them together to know that all words are not equal, um, that words are created by the meaning of the interaction dynamics that take place behind that. So while there are dictionaries that tell you the classical definition of trust and distrust, or the definition of collaboration means to cohort with the enemy. So, <laughs> as we've been using this word throughout all the time, it means that we have been imprinted with a caution around new relationships that has come from our millions of years of evolving because it is passed from generation to generation. So we have to overcome that is what you just provoked in this conversation. So we have to give more time. We can't, somebody said, well, I went in and I was nice to this person after, you know, they didn't trust me, but I came back and I was nice, Becky. And how come, <laughs> you know, how come it's not working? I tried to fix it. I did something now. They didn't respond to my being nice. And now, well, now we're in a worse place. We have to get that distrust carries more weight in the brain. We have to do a lot of things in order to show trust in a consistent way to move distrust from the top of the list of how I see you down to a lower level into how I am now experiencing you. Wow. So we have to really not expect that the other person is going to respond right away. Most fights in families, in marriages, is where somebody felt distrust from their partner. They did something nice. They didn't get why it wasn't fixed, like a Band-Aid. And then they go on and get divorced, right? right. We have to understand the dynamic of trust and distrust in the brain and in the workplace and any relationship. So you have to be more consistent in being trustworthy to someone. You have to show up that way on a regular basis. You have to, most of all, apologize for something that you've done. And if you didn't know that you did it, you have to talk about, I had no idea that this is going to impact you that way, or I had no idea that, that this happened, or that you went up, we call it the ladder of conclusions, meaning that you painted this as my picture forever. We, 
Yeah, when we learn those languages around conversational intelligence, how to have those conversations to move from distrust with somebody to trust, it changes everything. But it, don't expect it to be a one-shot deal and it's over because we've collected baggage, we've collected feelings, we've amplified them because we always think about a relationship over and over again in our brain even when we're not with that person. Yeah. And if I'm angry because you created distrust, I will think about it, I might dream about it. So. I want to give people that, that expectation to shift the expectation. Well, and I was thinking about, because we're, we're talking about the practical applications of what can you do to make that shift. And so to understand what's happening is really key. Um, to s apologize, mm -hmm. like that's a bad word these days. What's going on with that? Like, <laughs> right, yeah. staying that vulnerable space. But I, some work that I um, learned through the leadership program at Cleveland Clinic was about the six elements of trust. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking like all of us have these elements, time, reliability, standards, involvement, right? Um, and these, these different pieces that I, us being involved all the time may be really important, right? So we're, sh we're showing in our research that millennials love that involvement for their cortisol levels to go down and their oxytocin to go up. Yeah. They need to have that constant interaction to, I'm safe, I'm good, I know where I, they've got to know where they fit in. Whereas when you look at the baby boomers, so I'm about one year out, so I'm kind of Gen X baby boomers, the involvement is as important to me as, are you respecting my time? Are my standards good? And so it has to do with my behavioral style, my generation, like this trust thing's complicated. So what you just said is the difference, the generational difference that it might be the biggest generational shift we're gonna see in the world while we're alive, um, which is the baby boomers and the millennials because we were trained to be smart. We're part of that being smart, knowing it all, what is important, how, why I'm valued. So it's the I generation right before a we generation. And millennials are all about the group. They, they go on the uh, web and they have communities that they build on like LinkedIn and Facebook and strangers, oh like, just like fast. that. It's <laughs> not an issue. But being inside of a team and being important inside the team and having a role is so important. And so that's why I, I want to say we have five things that people can do to bring trust back. And I think that's what people want to hear about. What can you do? Okay. Once you understand the chemistry of trust and distrust in the brain, what do you do about it? So one is transparency. Transparency is the number one thing that starts to bring a relationship back. So if a person says to you, um, I can tell that our relationship isn't where I'd like it to be or you'd like it to be. And and I want to help do some things to, to make that better. But I also want to share that I know this particular interaction that must have been hard for you. M number one, it was hard for me. But most of all, I didn't realize the impact on you. And I want to apologize. And I want to learn what did I do that set us apart in such a difficult way. So I, I'm coming to you uh, opening my kimono, if, uh, if you will use that understanding, right? I want to share with you that it's whatever is going on inside of you, I share that. I want our relationship to be on a better foot. And I know something happened. I even think I know when it happened. But I want to talk about it. Are you open to see if we can do some work together about better understanding how to build our relationship? So that's being transparent about what happened. Let me ask you a question, though. So let's say that a person, you have that beautiful, open heart, I'm here, I want to be transparent. And their response is, no. Like, I'm really not ready to talk to you yet. So <laughs> if you get no, and I've never heard people say just no after that type of entree, just so that you know, that would be a new, a new one. But if they say, no, I'm over it, I, I'm not interested in a relationship with you. And you say, if this is what you see as the end of a relationship, I'd love to end it in a better way than this. So are there some so you things? Just accept it. You accept it. Yeah. And if that if it's been that hard for you and it's too difficult to work with me at work, I, I have to respect that because I know that I would want to work with somebody that, that where we support each other and now you're giving them a hint of what you would like just in case they change their mind. And I would want to have somebody that would listen and not make up things about what I've told to them. And, and I would want to have somebody that would have my back in a meeting. I would want those things too. And if you think it's too hard to do that with me, I'm going to step back and say, I apologize. And, and you know, let's... So, 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 no, I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking about your 10-10. Yeah. 
like this transparency part is the first part of the 1010 conversation that you teach that you say so her 1010 tool is about the idea that uh, there's certain people in your life and at work you need to have a 1010 relationship it's 10 for them it's 10 for you and it sounds like the conversation you just had is paramount at the beginning of that 1010 conversation to say here's what I want which you know goes to David Emerald's work of the empowerment dynamic you state what you want which is prefrontal cortex work Work. When I say what I want, I'm in my prefrontal cortex, I'm using my heart, I'm being vulnerable, I'm being transparent, and it sets up the conversation. And then they are then given the permission, even in a rough relationship, to be able to say, well, here's what I would want. You know, that's interesting, I, you know, because I think a lot of time you're having that conversation with someone you care a lot about and you want to have a good relationship, that that's what you wanted? Like, oh, you wanted to play tennis every, you know, or wow, you didn't show up to those company socials and, and that really made that big a difference to you? Because I didn't, I didn't think I was kind of sliding you by not doing that. Linda, you're right. People think what the other person might want and don't check what the other person might want. And they think about it possibly in light of an ideal that they have. In other words, I marry somebody because I think they're my ideal mate, but guess what? I missed this level and this level and this level. I didn't know that they could do this, this, and this, or wanted those things from me. And so the 1010 exercise is a way, if this person would have said, well, okay, I'm open, but let's figure out a better way to have conversations so we can talk about it. And I'd and I say, I have a great tool. I have something that I, I use in, in my relationships with people, and I'd love to do it with you. And it's how to, be, how to figure out what success means for both of us in a relationship. So we move forward with a better understanding of each other, and we work really hard to make it a good relationship. And then you're into a 1010. And yeah, and the, and, the other, and the other four parts you were talking about is, is re like you go from transparency and then relationship and then, then, now, then you move into kind of the second level, which is positional, which is understanding.